Hey, welcome back to the channel, everybody. This is Kevin. And in this week's video, we're going to take a look at a topic from the Encore exam blueprint. That's exam number 350-401. This topic is CEF, Cisco Express Forwarding. And I'm going to show you a video clip from my live Encore masterclass. And in this video, you're going to see how CEF operates, how it compares to other switching mechanisms, and how to verify it. By the way, when I say switching mechanisms, please don't think Cisco Catalyst switching at layer 2. Here we're talking about packet switching at layer 3, making forwarding decisions based on destination IP address information. And if you enjoyed this video, please do me a favor and click the like button down below and also subscribe so you don't miss any of our weekly content. Now enjoy this clip from my Encore Masterclass on Ceph. And the way that packet switching occurs could be really efficient in terms of processor power, or it could be really inefficient in terms of processor power. And we want to take a look at the uh, at the two main options that are out there today, because we're going to be using both of them. Uh, different times we're going to use, uh, use different switching processes. We're going to start by talking about the uh, the original, the uh, the OG, and that is process switching. That's where, uh, and I remember this is what we were using on the router that I first started with. This was the old Cisco AGS Plus router back in, uh, I think back in 1989, I was using this. And back then, we uh, would send a packet into the router and that, that packet would be analyzed by the router's processor. It would compare it to the routing table. Oh, looks like you go out of this interface and it would forward it on its way. But can you imagine doing that today? Today, some of our routers have gig interfaces. Some have 10 gig interfaces in our data center. We have some interfaces that are running at, at 40 gig and we're starting to see a little bit of 100 gig. Can you imagine just a 10 gig interface though? All the traffic that's coming through that and our, our lowly router, try, our lowly processor trying to make all those decisions in what hopefully is close to real time. It's, it's just not possible. So we've got some other options, but let's talk about when process switching is going to be used. Because sometimes we do need to analyze that packet. The router's processor does need to interact with that packet. Now, I'll give you a few examples. If I do a secure shell connection into the router for administrative purposes, that's a time. That's a time where I'm communicating with the router's processor because I'm interacting with the router directly. Another time I might use this is when I'm doing debugging for troubleshooting. And we talk a lot more about troubleshooting, by the way, in the NRC, uh, in the NRC class. And when you say debug IP OSPF packet or something like that, and you see all this information pop up on your screen or go to a syslog server, well, what's going to happen is all those all those debugged packets are going to be analyzed by the processor. But this just, like I said, it's not going to scale well for today's really high-speed networks. So let's take a look at some other options. Really, the, the other big option out there that we probably do want to be using is called CEF, C-E-F, Cisco Express Forwarding. And on many of our newer routers, CEF is on by default. Uh, by the way, if it's not on, you can simply type in in global configuration mode, IP space CEF, and it's, that turns it on. So it's pretty easy to turn on. But let's talk about some of the characteristics of Ceph. Like I said, it's much preferred over process switching and it's gonna be default on most of our devices. And the reason we prefer it so much is we pretty much leave the route processor out of the equation. When traffic comes in, in almost all cases, the router processor is not involved because Ceph, Cisco Express Forwarding, it maintains its own tables, which it can mathematically interrogate in a very efficient way. Specifically, it contains these two different tables. It contains something called, and these are some good terms to write down, the FIB, F-I-B. The FIB is the forwarding information base. And the forwarding information base is, it's, it's essentially the routing table. In fact, that's how it gets populated. We've got this FIB forwarding information base, or excuse me, we've got the CEF forwarding information base, and we've got the routing table. Well, when the routing table gets updated, those updates are immediately written to the FIB. So think of that as a very efficient route lookup source. 
that we can go to uh, without bothering the RAP processor. We also have an adjacency table, which gives us information about our next hop devices. Many times in a routing table, when we were trying to define how do we get to this destination network, it says, here's your next hop. Well, the adjacency table contains lots of information, and I'll take you out live in just a few moments and we'll check that out, but it contains lots of information about that next hop. Now, let's take a look at each of these tables one at a time though, shall we? The FIB, the forwarding information base, this is our layer three information. This is route prefixes as an example. Here's a, here's a destination network somewhere out there on our network or out on the internet. Here is the way to get there. We're going to go out of this egress interface. Here's the next top IP address. We'll get that kind of information. And this gets updated every time the routing table has an update. The routing table says, oh, I just updated. I better tell the FIB about that. And it gets updated pretty much in real time. Now, back in the early days, there, there was a concern with the FIB slowing down or the Ceph slowing down a little bit because if we hit it with too many requests, it was the same concern that we had with the processor. Is Ceph going to slow down? And back in the very, very early implementations of Ceph, the answer was a little bit. But today we've got these uh, ASICs, these application specific integrated circuits, which are which are pretty much real time. Uh, and uh, so we don't have that worry any longer. Now the adjacency table, that's gonna give us information on about uh, about who the next hop is, who is adjacent to this router. And we're gonna be able to see, for example, uh, and I'll show you this as well, but uh, let's say we're going out of an ethernet interface uh, and I can say, all right, here's this next hop. It's, we're gonna go out of this interface. Here's my MAC address. I'm going to go out of the interface with this MAC address and I'm going to go into their interface and their interface has this MAC address. So we can see detailed information about, about our neighbors, about our directly connected adjacent devices. And uh, here's the topology, really simple topology we're going to be working with. And I want to take you out live right now and, uh, and let's just play around with some commands. Let's look at, let's look at Ceph. Let's look at, uh, process switching. Oh, and I want to show you another one as well. We didn't even talk about this. This isn't really in the course, but just to, to round out our discussion, there was sort of an intermediary packet switching mechanism that you might have heard of. It's called fast switching. Fast switching works like this. In fact, sometimes it was called route once switch many because there was this uh, sort of like kind of like the FIB, not quite as efficient, but there was this table. It was called the route cache and it would store routes and next hops, kind of like the routing table. But when a packet came into the router, if, if the information about how to get to the destination network was not in the route cache, then that first packet in a communication flow, it would be routed up to the processor. So we were doing some process switching, but only the first packet in a flow. And as soon as the RAP processor said, oh yeah, if we're going from this source to this destination, you're going to go out of this interface and here's your next hop. And that information was copied down into this route cache area. So that was only the first packet that populated the route cache. Now, every packet that came in that's part of that flow, we, we don't have to bother the, the processor. We just use the route cache. Yeah. All right, I think we're good now. So let me try that one again. I'm gonna do show IP Ceph one more time. We've got a prefix column, which is showing the routes that might be in a routing table. Uh, we're seeing what the next hop is, if we're going to a next hop IP address. And if we are, we're saying, okay, we're gonna go, uh, go out of this interface to get there. We've only got one network that's not directly connected to R1. So notice we've only got one prefix showing up for a non-connected network. And that is 192.0.2.0/24, uh, slash and we see that the next hop is 203.0.113.2. And if you look at the topology, that's router R2, and we're going to be going out of our interface gigabit 0/2 in order to get there. What else do we see here? Well. We also see networks that are directly attached to us. If they're directly attached to us, they have a next hop of, of attached. So right under this one that we were looking at, 
Notice we've got the 198.150, or excuse me, 198.51.100.0/24. That's um, that's just off the top of R1. It says it is attached, and to get there, we're going to go out of interface gigabit zero slash one. We also see the IP address of router R2 as an adjacent router, and it says that it's attached. Isn't that interesting? That's this uh, 203.0.113.2. Yeah, it says that it's attached. So it's seeing that we're directly attached, <laughs> over a link anyway. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, some people are trying to type IPCF, uh, not supported. Uh, yeah, it, it's not supported on every platform. But normally it's uh, it's IPCF. All right. What else can we see on here? Uh, the interfaces. This is interesting. Some of these things are labeled receive. Why would something be labeled receive? Well, I'm going to be receiving on certain IP addresses. For example, uh, 198.51.100.1/32. That is gigabit zero slash one on R1, that's a directly attached IP address and it's set to receive. Also, notice we've got 198.51.100.0, that's the network address of this attached network and we've got the directed broadcast of the attached network. So all three of these are talking about that top link. I've got the IP address of the interface, I've got the, uh, I've got the network address and I've got the directed broadcast address and they are all set to receive. Now some things, some things are saying drop. What are we dropping? Well, believe it or not, we don't support multicasts. We don't support multicast with Ceph. So for our multicast address, we are dropping that traffic. For, I'm trying to find it here. Yeah, here's, uh, or actually, here's our multicast. This is Clice E IP addresses. We're dropping those as well. We're dropping any, uh, any, IP address that starts with the zero in the first octet. We're dropping loopback addresses. What happens to those addresses that are getting dropped? Well, Ceph is going to send them, it's called punting. Ceph is going to punt them to the next fastest switching mechanism. And that's gonna be maybe fast switching and maybe it's gonna go all the way back down to process switching. So that's a look at the FIB. That's a look at the layer three table that Ceph uses. Next up, let's take a look at the adjacency table. And I'll do a show adjacency detail command. And here, We've got, well, we've only got one adjacency to start with. That, that one adjacency is this uh, gigabit zero slash one interface off of R2. But we see its IP address. We have an adjacency. Here's the IP address of that R2 interface. To get there, we're going to go out of our gigabit zero slash two interface. And we see that uh, we've got this big string of hexadecimal numbers. What is that all about? This is commonly misunderstood. So let me break this down because this just looks like a bunch of gibberish right there. But really, we've got a couple of a couple of MAC addresses. You see this first MAC address that I've just highlighted? That first MAC address, that is the ingress interface on R2. So when I'm sending my frame over to R2, what I have highlighted on screen right there, that's the destination MAC address that I'm sending over to R2. Now I'm coming out of my interface, gigabit zero size two. Here's the MAC address that's my source. So we've got the source and destination MAC addresses to get to this adjacency. Would anybody like to guess what 0800 is? Go ahead and chat it in the, uh, the chat. If you would, go ahead and put that in the chat. If you'd like to venture a guess. What do you think the zero, uh, and yeah, I'm just killing 15 seconds because I know it takes a while for you guys to type in a response, but 0800, what is that? That is the ether type. That's the ether type code that's commonly seen on ethernet addresses. 
So 0800, that is our, that is our ether type. All right, um, I wanted to show you a little bit about process switching, and we talked a little bit about fast switching. We, we've taken a look at the uh, the fib, we've taken a look at the adjacency table. So now let's let's see if we are using any processor resources to to route traffic. Here's a command you might want to jot down. Uh, I'll do a show processes. CPU. Now this is going to show us all the processes and it goes on screen after screen after screen of all the processes running on our uh, CPU right now. But I want you to I want to direct your attention to this uh, CPU utilization line up top. It gives us average processor utilization over a five minute period, uh, over a one minute period, and over the last five seconds. Now interestingly, over the last five seconds, it gives us two percentages. This first percentage is the total processor utilization over the last five seconds, but you see this 0%, it's the number after the slash. That's going to be, that's going to be the amount of processor resources that was due to interrupts. And that's what, that's what process switching does. It interrupts the processor to make a forwarding decision. So right now it looks like I'm doing a little, if any, process switching because this number is at a zero. If I want to, yeah, let's say it's not a zero. If I want to see exactly how much information or how much process switching I'm doing, the if you want to jot this down, not this is not exam relevant. I just think this is really good to know for the real world when you're doing troubleshooting. The process that reflects process switching is called IP input, IP space input. That's the name of the process. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say show processes CPU, but I'm going to pipe it to include IP input, and it'll give us just that one line. So here I see, uh, I see the the five second, the one minute, and the uh, the five minute averages, and, and it's all zeros. That's because I'm not doing much. Why? Well, technically, I'm doing a little process switching because I'm I'm telnetted into this, and that's going to be using the processor. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't have any any production traffic flowing through there. Let's see, one other thing. Uh, it, we, we talked about fast switching just real briefly. Let me show you this. Let's do a, let's do a show interface gigabit zero slash two. Uh, let's see, is that the one we're using? I'll do a gigabit zero slash one stats. And this tells us very clearly for process, uh, it says here's your switching path. And for process switching, here's how many packets that we've switched with process switching. And yeah, I would ex I expected it to be some. After all, I'm, I have a conversation going on with the processor right now. And we also have route cache. Now this is if we're using fast switching. Now I don't have fast switching enabled on this interface, so it's zero. If you wanted to turn on fast switching, uh, well, first of all, IP, uh, IP Ceph, that's the command I told you that would turn on Ceph, but not on every platform. Check your documentation. But if I want to turn on fast switching for an interface, I would go into, let's say, interface gigabit 0 slash 1, and I would say IP route, well, let me just show you the since that, uh, context sensitive help to show you, but it's route hyphen cache. Let's find it here. Yeah. It says this enables f the fast switching cache. Remember, this is the one where we route once and we switch many. Mm -hmm.